Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Hey, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm delighted to see you all. Um, first off, we have thank yous. So, um, in addition to the fabulous uh, continuing education staff here, and Karen and all the work that she does. I, I have a couple of people that work with me in our Center for Access to Justice and Technology who have been instrumental in sort of a lot of the infrastructure of the um, breakout sessions and pulling and getting the work done to train the students and get back the list of uh, innovations and so on. And they're here in the room. So Jessica Bullock, will you stand up and wave around? And Andrew Medeiros, we appreciate all the work. <laughs> and. And, and actually, you know, so Richard asked me before, what's the difference between training and education? So um, this is sort of apropos of that. In addition to all this sort of um, logistics work and helping manage students and participate in some of our, our teaching, um, Andrew was my co-author on the, on the uh, lead article in Justice, Lawyering, and Legal Education in the Digital Age, which is sort of the... the um, uh, inspiration for this morning session. We're trying to do a little bit of a, of a, a, a redo of a, of a symposium that we did in June, so you get a little piece of the ideas that came from that. And so um, thank you, Andrew, for all your hard work and, and helping draft that. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is, is mention, um, which, um, and, and, and perhaps we should have mentioned earlier, but we have some, from some fabulous sponsors and some of their material and um, um, uh, publications are on the tables just outside the door. Um, including Greenfield Belzer, Attorney at Work, Inside Legal, Practical Law Company, Matter and Associates, RICO, um, the ABA's Law Practice Management Section, ILTA, Altman Weil, LMA, ALA, and Novus Law. So we're going to give a hand to all of those people. <coughs> without, without them, no donuts, no, you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't happen without them. And we appreciate their efforts and we hope to grow that part of our, um, of our platform and our footprint. Um, so here's the um, schedule for today. Um, we're probably seven minutes past, and so we're gonna, we'll, we'll just push back about seven or ten. We'll put back, push back ten minutes on, on the schedule. Um, but, but despite the performance of, of our really excellent TED people yesterday, um, this group is going to stay right on time. All right? <laughs> All right. And so we, ha we have to get through in 45 minutes a lot of material. Um, and I'm going to take about six or seven or four or five, I guess, at this point, just to do a little bit of an introduction. Um, but the rest of the schedule is up there. We end um, the, the formal, the, the formal uh, conference with a, um, a lunch at noon on our 10th floor. Um, everything else through the day is pretty much like yesterday. You go to breakout sessions based on the thing on the back of your, um, of your name tag and so on. Um, but the, the, it's a plated lunch on the 10th floor. It's a nice room. You had uh, your um, cocktails and, and um, hors d'oeuvres there last night. Um, and uh, Jim Sandman, who was one of our fellows and, and the president of the Legal Services Corporation, will be our, um, our provocateur at lunch to talk about giving back and thinking of ways that we can make the world better. Um, well, so, so this symposium um, is available to people that want it. Now, it's interesting, there was a time that if you gave away a book that people would line up to get the book, right? But people don't line up to get the book. So you can click on our materials and find all this data, all these articles um, in the electronic materials. So you don't need to get the book. But if, you, if it's fun for you to have in paper, a series of nine terrific articles about innovations in the future of legal education, including articles by, I see Oliver Goodenough is here, and uh, are there other authors out there besides Oliver? I think, Oliver, you're the only other one who is not, uh, isn't up here, right? And three of them are up here. And so the purpose of this morning is to sort of prime the pump a little bit um, and to showcase Chicago Kent. So the, we're the host, so we get a, a little bit of a showcase. Um, the, the, the showcase that, that my panelists offer is the, is the um, I guess, the prestige that comes from associating with really great people in the context of this symposium. Um, and, and that's important. Um, the other point of this is to, is to um, give you some new ideas about innovations in legal education coming from practitioners and, and educators and, and organizations that, that, uh, that uh, uh, provide services and information to, to law schools um, to sort of get you going on, on the task that Bill Henderson will, will launch in, in about 45 minutes. Um, so um, the bragging part. Um, we have, in addition to the oldest three-year legal writing requirement and the oldest law firm in a law school 
initiative that, that the dean talked about yesterday morning. Um, I've been sort of personally involved with, that, I think, of a 30-year uh, tradition of innovation, half of it about law and computers, and half of it about technology and, and um, the web and, and, and legal services to middle and low-income people. And so, um, If you look at the 15 years starting in about um, 1983, we had the first microcomputer laboratory. We did the first study of the pervasive use of, of Lexus, where every student had their own Lexus number. There was a time when there was only one Lexus machine in each law school that you signed up for time to learn online legal uh, online um, uh, research. Um, and we did studies of the pervasive use of computers by law students. In studies, I mean, we did empirical work. We analyzed what happened if we gave students computers, gave them some tools to use computers, and then measured their grades, right? Very few people have ever done that since. Nobody's done it since. Um, but it, it opened many doors at the time that many faculty members are now trying to close because they want to turn off those computers in the classroom that, that we sort of launched into that space. Um, we also did things with the profession. We did the only large firm technology survey. We surveyed the, the 500 largest law firms and found the progression of computers on the desktop of big, big firm lawyers um, and started Tech Show. I, I see Tom Grilla and some other Tech Show people here as well. So, we're really proud of that history. Um, from that history, we sort of moved into this law, computers, uh, lawyering, legal education, and um, self-represented litigants space. And starting 15 years ago, we studied in a big million dollar study, um, self-represented litigants. We looked at them like customers and went in five courts for weeks at a time, following them around, um, using design methodology from our Institute of Design. That was mentioned a little bit by Renee Kanaki yesterday as, as a, a theme of the Michigan State Reinvent Law. It's a great theme. There are things that designers can teach us in the way to think about solving problems that MBAs and lawyers can't teach us. And that combination is really a powerful one. Um, we also built the first self-help web center in Illinois where students, hundreds of students have volunteered to help thousands of people. Um, and John will tell you a little bit more in a minute about, about two other projects that are ongoing now that we're very excited about. One is the expansion of the A to J author platform as a vehicle for providing information and, and um, resources to low-income people. And um, the project involving expanding the use of these kinds of teaching tools to other clinics with six other law schools involved. So that, that's our sort of our, our bragging rights and I, uh, I and thank you for your indulgence while we talk about that. Um, what I want to do now is, is turn over to our panel um, for, for four sort of six minute punchy presentations on innovations driven by, you know, this kind of, this kind of background. Come on, John, you can come up. I'll, I'll, I'll get your um, hoopla up here. I thought you said 60 minute. <laughs> well, good thing I've been drinking uh, my espresso drink, so I'll be uh, speaking a lot faster now. I'll stand right here to help you. Um, good. You might want to get to the <clears throat> beginning of it. That must be where you left it. <laughs> cool. Good morning. All right, man, if you, come, if you make it out on a Saturday morning, you're dedicated, thank you. My name is John Mayer. I'm the Executive Director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. We're a nonprofit consortium of almost every law school in the country. Been around for about 30 years. We sit at the intersection of education, legal education, technology, and law. And to uh, an increasing amount, what I, uh, sort of a fourth pillar of CALI, uh, access to justice. And um, I'm here to talk about uh, something called the A to J Clinics Project. Does this work? Yeah. That would be next. There we go. So, but I have to start with, well, what's A to J? Well, A to J author stands for Access to Justice. Clever of us, huh? It's a piece of software that we wrote under a grant from Legal Services Corporation that is used by legal aid lawyers to automate court forms, right? A lot of effort was put into it about eight, nine, almost 10 years ago in the design part so that it was especially easy for the two main constituents here, which is to say 
the pro se or the self-representing litigant would, who, <clears throat> in which technology might be a threatening thing, English might be a second language, may not have finished high school back in 2002, jumping on the web was, uh, was something that not everybody was doing. And we wanted to create an interface that would say, you know, there's not a lot of ads, there's not a lot of crap going on, there's not a lot of distractions. It's a clean, lots of white space interface that's going to take you down this gentle pastoral road to justice, which is often the distance. Um, the second group that we were concerned about was the, uh, was the authors. We wanted to pull the programmer out. It took too long, it cost too much to automate a court form if every time that had to happen, a programmer had to sit next to a lawyer. Right? We, you know, the scheduling alone would have been impossible. Um, and so the interface is intended for relatively non-technical or only slightly technical capable lawyers to be able to uh, automate their own forms or legal processes. So um, the interface basically generate, creates, a, it, it basically creates an interface that lets the user walk themselves through, potentially to branch based on the answers to questions, uh, filling in the information. In other words, it doesn't necessarily walk you through a PDF fillable form, because what you might do is front load things like uh, means testing or other things that would get the person out of there fast. So are you here because you have a parking ticket? Yes. Yeah, we don't do that here. Go someplace else. So it might shunt, shunt you off to a different website or to a different link very quickly, saving you, the pro se, lots of time and preventing a lawyer think of a legal aid person on a hotline having to ask a bunch of questions and their time being taken up, which results in, sorry, we won't, we can't help you. And then, you know, everybody's like, well, why did you waste my time? Why don't you ask me that question first? Well, the computer can do that for you. All right. So is, is this being used very much? Heck yeah. So 600,000 times last year and well over a million couple out now, I think that's a total of over two million times, uh, somebody ran one of 800 automated forms, and those are the ones we can measure. There's a bunch of them that are on websites that we can't measure because they don't uh, gather statistics, and those generated over 300,000 uh, forms. Now, that's a good thing that not all of them generated a form because of what I just said. It, it might be that the lawyer who wrote it built in lots of things that would shunt people off to, you know, because you're in the wrong place, go someplace else, or we can't help you with this form, or we can't automate that complicated a process or something like that. You actually do have to contact or deal with an attorney. Um, but this is a problem, right? The problem is that this hockey stick it doesn't show the potential for this. There's not 600,000, it's not like, well, now all those pro se's are all taken care of. No, the, the hockey stick is actually up at about a million or 10 million uh, you know, uh, forms that might need to be filled out. And, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a form form, not like a 1040. It could be a pleading, it could be a letter, it could be a, uh, you know, something simple uh, like that. And so we run into the problem now of running this process for many years that how do we scale this up, right? Those 800 forms were automated by maybe 40 or 50 different people. There aren't a lot of lawyers, Too or there isn't job. a lot of money. There isn't a lot of money that we have to be able to uh, uh, pay people to automate lots of forms. So maybe there's an opportunity in law schools. And why would we think law schools? Well, Cali wrote this software and we're a consortium of law schools, right? So it turns out Ron's been teaching a class for a couple of years called the Justice and Technology Practicum. And he makes his students go through this process of field observation, writing a scope document, uh, creating a research memo, and then programming or creating an A to J guided interview that can be automated, right? These are some of the examples that we've, that he's uh, created from his, that his students have created from his class. I won't linger on that, except to say that uh, there's, um, it, th this results in the students learning a lot about a legal process, a deep dive into the procedure, the heuristics, the thing that never gets taught in law school, you know, the stuff that's not doctrine, uh, exposure to ethical issues, um, and what we believe to be, competencies that are relevant to 21st century law lawyering. So now I finally get to my, the beginning of my presentation, just kidding, um, <laughs> access to justice clinics. So we take Ron's idea, which is to teach students how to program, with quotes around it, with A to J author, 
and we put a website up, and then we make that available. Then we, we, we got a grant, and we, we went to six schools and, and gave them our course materials and said to those six schools, figure out a way to incorporate A to J author into your course. And it doesn't have to be exactly the same as Ron's course, but here's, his, here's his, all of his materials as a starting point so that you can sort of see how he did it once. And there's a whole bunch of uh, clinic models that that represents. I'm actually really close to finishing here, so this is good. With the goal that we're going to create a bunch of websites or a bunch of materials from these different schools that we will then publish back to those 200 law schools. This results in a win for law students, right? They get all those, they get this, they get this experience in automating a legal process. Uh, the law schools get to include this in their curriculum. Legal aid, because we're going to pair these law students up with legal aid organizations who don't have enough money to pay lawyers or to get grants to automate forms, and the public gets more forms automated. Win, 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 win. That's basically the A to J Clinics project. All right. <laughs> I got 10, right? <clears throat> no. All right, I'll, I'll speak really quick. Okay, my name is Richard Granite. Uh, one, I wear a couple of different hats. The thing I'm most proud of, I've been running something called the e-learning task force with my colleague Mark Lauritsen for ABA, Law Practice Management. It was a task force that was set up by a president of the ABA around 2000 to help lawyers figure out how to deliver legal services online. We thought everything was gonna happen by 2004. We were off by about 10 years. Uh, it's just beginning to happen really now since the uh, uh, recession. And we see a big knowledge gap among lawyers still about how to actually deliver what we call digital and legal services online. Uh, when I went to law school, I went to Columbia. I had a great legal education. They didn't teach me anything about actually practicing law. The difference between education and training is that education changes behavior, changes values, changes the way you think like a lawyer. Training teaches you tasks. A way to think about that is if you had a child in junior high school, what would you rather have them have, sex education or sex training? Uh, however, uh, 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 by the time you get to law school, I believe there should really be a balance between training and education, particularly for those second, third, and fourth year law schools where most of the graduates end up in solo and GP practice, where they have to really be practice ready when they graduate. So Stephanie Kimbrough and I wrote an article called uh, A New Paradigm for Law Practice Management. Stephanie Kimbrough wrote the book on virtual lawyering to basically reconceive the way law practice management and technology is taught in law schools where it's really infused with technology and digital knowledge. Uh, we believe today that you can't be competent to be a lawyer unless you really understand the way technology interfaces with law as evidenced by the new change in 1.1, which is the definition of the competence of a lawyer recommended by ABA 2020. Uh, this is the change in 1.1 where lawyers have to understand the risks and benefits of using technology. Uh, tomorrow's lawyers, this is the quote from Suskin where the large uh, job growth is gonna be in mixed careers between uh, lawyers, uh, <clears throat> between the interface between legal technology and legal services, and there'll be a whole bunch of new careers for lawyers, which we think are the fastest growing area of the legal profession, which uh, Bill can talk more about. Uh, what do lawyers know? They still don't know much about. I've talked to hundreds of solo practitioners in my role as running direct law, which is a virtual law firm platform. I can't tell you how much they don't know. <clears throat> Only two or three percent really uh, get it compared to what's going on in LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer and all the non-lawyer interlopers. Uh, so what is law school for? I'm not going to go through all this because I don't have really time, but uh, this is what law schools don't do. They don't do any training and systemization, standardization, no training and knowledge processing. 
uh, uh, no way of really thinking about uh, client development and how to connect with clients, how to deliver legal services. Uh, for those law schools where lawyers are going to own their own practice, they really have to move into this space in, in a more aggressive and more powerful way. I think of law school as trade school for many of these uh, second, third, and fourth tier law schools. Uh, they need to teach lawyers to like run a restaurant, know how to price, know how to buy, know how to deal with an excellent customer experience, know how to market, know how to manage people, etc. There's a huge latent market for legal services that we're now touching. The, le the legal profession can't maintain its claim to monopoly if 90% or 75% of America can't afford the prices that, that a lawyer is charged. So there's a real challenge here. Uh, there are strategies that are not putting in place which suggest to us that lawyers can really meet the needs of a, a, low, a moderate and middle income clientele, which is our, our, my focus and our fo focus for some of our, all of our, this panel, I think. Uh, I think that law practice management, law practice technology are core legal competencies. And when you think about the other kinds of things that lawyers need to learn about, like unbundling legal services, that's a form of legal process engineering. Uh, lawyers need to understand this changing environment, how to relate to it. Uh, this is Stephanie's book on the consumer law revolution where she talks about really what's happening. I recommend it. It's an ABA publication. Uh, so, let me see. so I did a list of 14 of all the law schools that were really committed to teaching uh, law students uh, legal technology and law practice management. Chicago Kent's a leader in that. We have others, University of Indiana. We have, uh, uh, we have Michigan State. Uh, we have Georgetown. There was only 14. Our standing committee, which Mark and Will and I work on, have just done a national survey of all the law schools to try and figure out what the law schools are actually doing in the area of legal technology and law practice management. We've gotten responses from maybe 45 or 50 law schools. What is it, 60 or something like that? Uh, it's, it's very poor. It's still a very, very small percentage. So the innovation here is to try and introduce into the law school curriculum uh, courses in applied legal technology and applied legal practice management. Um, fortunately, I was fortunate in putting together a project with my colleague Stephanie Kimbrough at a third tier law school in Florida called Florida Coastal, where we're creating a new center for law practice technology. This is the pitch. You have 30 seconds. All right, the pitch is we're going to create basically a curriculum which implements Susskind's ideas of tomorrow's lawyer with a set of courses on legal process engineering, legal design, document automation, expert systems, social media, law practice management, uh, all the skills that we think we need to introduce students to for a 21st century practice. Thank you. Terrific. Good morning. My name is Will Hornsby. I'm staff counsel at the American Bar Association, so I may continue to be so. I want you to understand that nothing I say this morning should be the, the, considered the policies of the ABA or any of its constituent entities. Any questions so far? Great. Thank you. All right. Going on to my next uh, four and a half minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk about incubators. Yes. Uh, we've seen the headlines. We know that Nine months after graduation, uh, for the past couple of years, less than 60% of those graduates have obtained employment in uh, jobs that require a legal degree. And so there's this vast uh, number of people graduating from law school that don't have legal jobs. And one of the um, opportunities that we have is uh, uh, to incubate their solo practices in ways that encourage them to address that latent legal marketplace that uh, Richard was talking about, to address the needs of personal, uh, personal legal needs of people of moderate and low income. And this concept originated with Fred Cooney, uh, Fred Rooney from Cooney. Um, <laughs> Fred was a legal aid practitioner. He left uh, legal aid to set up his own practice and soon realized he didn't have a clue about how to do anything except the law work. He didn't know how to manage an office. He didn't know how to get clients. Um, and he took that um, experience 
uh, to back to his alma mater at CUNY, and he said, we need to provide our graduates with this kind of assistance, and they created an incubator just like a business incubator. Now, when you look at this slide, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, gee, does the ABA really sell hoodies for legal rebels? Um, but <laughs> at, at any rate, uh, so our chat... Our challenge, yeah, 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 I know. Where, where's yours? Um, I know Ron shamed you into wearing a tie today. So, um, uh, so, so, so um, you know what we what, what these efforts need to do and are doing. Um, and, and by the way, Fred's um, initiative just got no traction until the recession, and then people perked up, and the, these figures started to flow in about the um, unemployment of lawyers. So, um, you know, the current and, and the pre-recession. Um, uh, models to make lawyers practice ready, fellowships, bridge programs, which were a weekend where people sat in the back and texted each other, um, uh, mentorships um, where people, new lawyers would learn the way that old lawyers did it badly, um, and, and, and practice management advisors, which I think is really a great uh, uh, concept but not pervasive enough where people like Catherine Sanders Reach go out and, and do CLEs and help people even one-on-one -on -one in certain circumstances. So the incubator skills, you know, like I said, there's um, Fred was challenged with these three different things. There's the development of substantive skills, practice management, and client development. When we take students who are lawyers who are new graduates, they don't even have the substantive skills like a, a, a legal aid refugee might have. Uh, and, and so um, we really need to have those three skill sets addressed, and that's what's being done uh, around the country as these programs uh, uh, emerge primarily from law schools, but also from bar entities. The Chicago Bar Foundation uh, is in the midst of a, an experiment with an incubator, and uh, Taylor uh, Hammond is the director, and Bob, uh, Bob Glaves is the director of the Chicago. Yeah, and Bob Glaves is the director of the Chicago Bar Foundation that really set this in motion, and, and they've done a great job. Um, uh, but it's primarily uh, a function of law schools serving their uh, alumni. Uh, and there's a wide range of economic commitments. The models are fundamentally broken into um, incubators and residencies. The residencies are kind of built off the medical model um, where the law school is actually the law firm, actually has a law firm, and the residents work for the law firm. And the incubator, um, the, um, the, the overarching entity, um, is a coordinating mechanism, but each of the participants have their own law practice, which they port with them after they go out of the incubator. And these programs offer a, a range of things, um, free or reduced office space, Space, um, CLE programming, mentoring, practice management assistance, referrals, and I think probably the most important thing as they enter into careers as solo and small firm practitioners is the networking, the ability for them to uh, uh, talk with each other, talk in a community, create their own community, um, and they're frequently um, linked together through listservs or other uh, mechanisms that, to do that. We've been tracking this model. We have a web page uh, at uh, uh, ambar.org slash incubators where we have uh, profiles of the programs that currently exist and are emerging on this. Um, and um, the, the challenges as we go forward, I mean, this might be a flash in the pan if the market corrects itself and we don't have a high, range, a high number of uh, on and underemployed lawyers and legal needs of people of moderate income are being well met at some point in the future. Um, but I think it's probably more like the clinical movement was 40 years ago. Um, it's very organic movement right now. It's coming from the from the bottom up, from the needs um, uh, without having um, uh, particular models. So there's lots of experimentation, but the two challenges are the ability to scale it because we are literally dealing with um, nearly 10,000 graduates a year who need to, to have some kind of measure of support for their employment um, and um, uh, and 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 the other, and and these models typically deal with um, somewhere between five and thirty uh, people apiece, um, and and we need to look at the way that it can be sustained. Um, the the law schools are investing. In some cases, the bar associations and foundations are investing. I think the future of this is for law firms to provide support 
because um, the moderate income delivery component of this and the ability to do so in innovative ways and to expand on that is something that's going to make their communities more economically viable, richer, um, and, and have the benefit of the rule of law. So I think I'm going to Yeah, mm -hmm, thanks. Perfect. Uh, good morning, Mark Lauritsen, Capstone Practice Systems. I'm a serial collaborator. I've collaborated with Richard Granite for a decade on this e-learning task force with, with Ron on this really excellent symposium. I highly recommend if you don't even like paper, grab a copy because Ron's got a huge box in his office. Well, it's more than that. I mean, Mark was the co-editor of the symposium, and I forgot to say that, so I'm sorry, Mark. It was, not, a, great, not, it was a great work. I'm also the co-editor of a great uh, uh, collection with Oliver Goodenough, who's in the audience, called Educating the Digital Lawyer, which I highly recommend. Um, so we've, we've, we've built this massive apparatus, this national environment for delivering interactive forms and knowledge modules for people who can't afford lawyers and for those who help them. And at some point, we started thinking, or at least I started thinking, there's one slight detail, which is, is this legal? Uh, are, we in, are we entitled to do this, to give people advice, frankly, and documentation that's highly customized to their circumstances? So I want to talk very briefly about two topics. One, you've already heard about apps for, uh, this, this cyber clinic project, which we also call Apps for Justice. And this uh, question is, is this kind of software unauthorized practice of law? At least a number of federal and state judges have said yes. They're, they have enjoined uh, the distribution of, of tools like self-help will systems and bankruptcy websites. <clears throat> and in thinking about it, there's really three modes of service we can talk about. Traditional service, face-to-face, -face, you know, human-to-human -human contact, where the professional does all the work. Co-production scenarios are unbundling where the, the attorney and the uh, client are both participating in different aspects of the work and kind of accessing tools to do that. And then the self-help scenario where uh, someone who has knowledge and information about how to accomplish a legal task puts it into a piece of software, makes that available through the cloud or some other means, and then the, the recipient of the help is using it without contemporaneous involvement. And that's really what we're focusing on. Is that uh, permissible? Many, many years ago in New York, there was a famous book called How to Avoid Probate. Uh, the New York Bar Association went, went against this guy and said, wait a second, this tells people how to do their, their legal work and to give some forms and instructions. And uh, it was brought to the court. The court ultimately upheld this activity as free expression, First Amendment. And so law is not being practiced when you distribute a book. What happens when it's software, whether it's a, a disk or a CD or a website, and someone has, again, taken the knowledge, built it into this interactive device, and made it available? Some people feel like, wait a second, hey, you, that's, that's the practice of law. You're giving information and advice. You're, you're producing artifacts that are things that only lawyers should be permitted to do. So my article goes into this in great detail, thinking about both the public policy considerations and, more importantly to me, the constitutional values and principles of free expression. And is a program more like a book, which is pretty safely protected, like newspapers, as a work of authorship that should be uh, freely expressible in, a, in an open society, or is it more like a professional service? And in fact, it shares attributes of both. And you can look at the book for more details about that. Apps for Justice was uh, a, a name Ron and I gave to this, this, this campaign to set up clinics at law schools in which students do this kind of thing as part of their education, taking advantage of the pedagogical value of actually writing software and learning how to express knowledge in these interactive things. And as, as, as John explained, uh, involves uh, in some schools uh, developing A to J modules, these guided interviews that take you through a process of information gathering and advice giving. It involves in some schools creating uh, templates. At other schools, it involves using uh, Michael Mills' Neotologic engine. And our notion, as I think John also mentioned, is quadruple bottom line. For the student, it's not only a learning opportunity, but it's a career positioning opportunity, opening it up for, for new uh, lines of possible careers. 
for lawyers, it, it, it provides an opportunity to have more prosperity and, and professional satisfaction by having tools that let you do your work faster, cheaper, better, deliver more services for society, access to justice. And for law schools, <coughs> it's one of several opportunities to resuscitate the value proposition. And so, concluding slide, we're trying to, you know, we're in this kind of vicious cycle at the moment where the, the um, collapse of the, of, the, of the legal market is, is also causing great havoc at law schools and putting pressure on law schools uh, that in some ways stands in the way of interesting and useful innovation. And the hope here is that, I think I, I'll, I'll skip it, but, but the hope is that we can catalyze a, a, a virtual cycle here by producing students who are better prepared to practice, deliver high value services, therefore contributing back to society, to law schools, and uh, we'll all be, we'll all be better off. So on early Saturday morning, I hope your pump is primed. I love these guys. These are my people, right? I've done stuff with them for years. If it weren't for them, nothing would be going on in this field. They've made so many great things happen in the practice and in the, in the law school setting that I, I'm really proud to be uh, part, of the, part of the team. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Susan. Susan, are you here? Ah, good. Good morning, that was wonderful. Um, the, the, what's exciting to me about that presentation is clearly innovation has been going on for 10, 20 years. And I think it's just a question of how we now bring that to a uh, broader, bigger level. So this morning is a culmination of, you know, yesterday's start with starting with the, the um, considerations of where the market's going, how that's gonna impact legal services. And we had our breakout then to talk about that, move then into how our law firm is going to adapt to those market changes and the change, changing needs for legal services. And this morning, obviously, starting with this great panel, we're going to talk a little bit now about, okay, how are our law schools, legal educators, uh, different kinds of vendors, providers going to now train the future lawyers and future technicians and future whatever fill-in-the-blank roles that we need so this morning we have Bill Henderson with us, who is going to, I think, supplement very nicely the uh, framework that was already set for us. And I'm delighted to introduce Bill, who is the professor of law at Indiana University Maurer School of Law and the Val Nolan Fellow. He's also a director on the Center on the Global Legal Profession. He received his BA from Case Western, his JD from the University of Chicago. Uh, and in 2006 was the winner of the, two, the uh, Leon Wallace Teaching Award. Um, Bill's done lots of innovation himself. He's written and published scores and scores of uh, papers and studies. He writes, um, he, he actually does a lot of empirical work, which I think we'll probably hear a little bit from Bill today. So without further ado, I'll leave it to Bill, and then we'll go in and, and see what we can do with some of the framework we've already heard this morning. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Susan. Thanks, Ron. All right, I'm, uh, I'm at, uh, can everybody hear me okay? I am absolutely delighted uh, to be here. I was sitting in the front row, and I took a picture with my iPhone. Thank God for iPhones, but there's something I'm even more grateful for than iPhones. I mean, usually when you get a panel of uh, white men that have silver in their, in their, in their, in their uh, hair, it's, it's, sometimes we can, be, we can kind of make fun of them. But I wouldn't make fun of this particular uh, panel. I, I knew I was witnessing history as I was sitting there in the front row, and I wanted to take a picture of it because for a period of decades, these uh, gentlemen had a vision, and they were working very hard on it, and only now uh, it's going to become the new uh, uh, black, and we're going to be, a lot of people are going to do well and do good, a lot of young people do well and do good, and they're going to be standing on your shoulders. And so I want to give you guys a round of applause for, uh, for just sticking with it, for sticking with it when, uh, when, uh, when there was no external, uh, when there was no external rewards in sight. Uh, and so uh, I hope, by the way, you guys do well and do good, too, because you've been doing, you've been in the wilderness for a while. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, the talk uh, is 12%, uh, and the 12% is a solution. I'll try and make that as, uh, as clear 
as I can. So kind of let's go with this. So what, what is the problem? And this is the session on legal education. I think that if we had to boil it down to uh, what's going on in legal education and what the problem is, we could just put on there's inadequate value being, uh, being uh, attained uh, in legal education. We can break it down into the three uh, basics, inaccurate quality. We've got complaints about quality. We've got complaints about time that it takes uh, too long to achieve inadequate, in, inaccurate, in, inadequate quality. Like three years is too long to get what we get. If we're only going to get this, let's do it in two. And we think we can get it in two. And then there's costs because students are incurring enormous amounts of debts. And the federal government is basically backstopping that. And those of us that uh, see parallels with the housing market think this is going to end badly. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, uh, country, and so we've got a definite shortfall in value. Now I know it is a bit of a, uh, a data guy, but it's nice. I can do a, I can do a lot of work today with just one simple graph, and so uh, and so I want to show you my basic uh, graph here. This graph pretty much explains uh, everything that's going on in the legal economy, the legal industry writ large, and uh, not everything, but the traditional legal services economy uh, and uh, law schools. I mean, we've got a long history of kind of like. Slow and steady, and things go up, we can add more people, we'll make more uh, money, and things go really, really well. We begin to think, well, that's just the natural order of things in the legal industry. And all of a sudden, in around 2008, 2004, if you look at the census data, but nobody was paying attention to that, but 2008, everybody would agree that we're going sideways. What are we going sideways on? A lot of different things. Uh, one of them is revenues, and that makes, uh, for, for industries that are used to growing, it makes people very uncomfortable not to grow. And we're used to uh, going in and out of recessions, and so we have to uh, shuffle seats maybe for a year or two. But this has been going on for a while. We're beginning to think this isn't a recession. It's actually a structural uh, shift. So if revenues are going this way, and it's actually not going sideways, it's actually going down. Uh, and then law school applications are going down. Why? Because, because jobs are going down. And so uh, this is really, really problematic. I only need one more graph to kind of drive home uh, the point. So this, this, this crooked kind of hockey stick thing will do most of the work. But uh, here's this one here, which is law schools, because uh, you know we, we just admitted a little under 40,000 law school graduates in the year uh, two, in the fall of 2013. Last time we admitted only a little under 40,000 was the early to mid 1980s. So so oh, you know we're going back you know just a few decades. That's not a big deal. There was 163 uh, law schools last time we had a little under 40,000 students. Now there's 201. So we got this additional bricks and mortar financed not by a kind of a, a, a kind of a buyer's market that uh, that contracts. I mean, uh, if you get into an ABA accredited law school, the the, the federal government will 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 uh, float the money and they'll do it at the cost of of enrollment. And so, and we define what cost of enrollment is. So it's a bit of a Mad Hatter's Tea Party that's uh, going on. And this gap right here is uh, is really what's 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 difficult. To, I, I go and I give talks at law firms and they say, oh, we've got really difficult business process. I'm in a law school. I mean, you should see my business problems. They're very, very serious. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, so um, now I'm going to traffic a little bit in models. And uh, 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 all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is Ed Box. And I was uh, reminded of this when I was sitting in a session with Ron Friedman yesterday. And he was saying, you know, uh, clients, lawyers, say is the is the risk 110 or 100 and if they if they don't know exactly what it is they perspire the fact that they don't know what it is clients are like well if it's 8 or if it's 12 it's roughly 10 and they kind of move on models are really useful even though uh, the lawyers will just say well is this they they look to see how it's imperfect but we fail to step back and say this is useful this is roughly right rather than precisely wrong so, uh, so I'm going to traffic a little bit in models. And my first one is, and so I want to make it a little bit interactive here because it's early on a Saturday uh, morning. And so we're going to do a little bit of pattern recognition. I know that you guys are the high IQ crowd, so this won't be too, too difficult for you. Uh, tell me what my first model is. What am I trying to render here spatially? Or anybody tell you? I, I have clues built in. Uh, so, so this is the, the Raven's Progressive Advanced Matrix test backwards. And so, so uh, bad news is nobody's got an IQ of 180 in the room. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm, I'm making, what's that? <laughs> John's advanced. Does that, does that help at all? It's, it's, it's interesting because I did this one other uh, time and they said it was an Ian Neft and this is a kind of a forest trees kind of a, uh, uh, issue. Uh, does this help? Was that uh, help? You know what I think it is. I think it's, this is beautiful. You know why this is? This is the, this is the the the, the common law school curriculum. 
Uh, and, and, and you can see there's three years, and each one is a class, and the class is a different color. It's divided by semesters. You know why I think it's so beautiful? Is because I get, to, I get to control one of those dots. I get to pick the color. I get to do everything I want to do with it. It, it. Within my class, I have complete and total autonomy. Nobody tells me uh, what uh, uh, to do. And so uh, that's legal education. It's basically 26 or 27 people doing whatever the hell that they want. And we can kind of do it, to, and we kind of add it up and just say, here's your legal education. And I think that, well, maybe, uh, but it's beautiful because I picked the color. You know, from my perspective, from a consumer's point of view, it's not so uh, uh, good. So this is model 1.0. And you know what? Uh, it's uh, ironic, but uh, you go to other parts of the world, and they're migrating toward our 1.0. You go to Japan, and uh, oh, uh, Canada is, is, to a certain some extent, migrating toward our model. Uh, uh, and so, um, so here, what I want to do is I want to say a 2.0 uh, would be sequenced. At least the colors are in order. You know, there's a, there's a logic to how they're kind of sequenced and everything like that. And I'm going to say that we could also improve it if we did this, if we kind of coordinated it, which meant that what was going on in the semester where professors were talking to one another and we kind of trying to achieve the same stuff. Now, you can just see that uh, uh, I'm given, I'm losing some of my freedom here. I'm not particularly like that, but you can see how this might be good from a, uh, from a, from a student or a consumer society point of view. Uh, here's 3.0. It's totally integrated. We're back to the round circle. We like round, but it's much bigger than me by myself as a circle, and it's kind of multi-colored. Uh, and you can see the area it takes up is, is less. So maybe this is better, cheaper, and faster. Now, 3.0 doesn't exist yet. It really doesn't. Uh, but uh, all of us have a 3.0 in our minds, and it's, it's possible to think that what, however the problems or the virtues of 1.0 are, I think everyone would agree, well, there's got to be a way to do this better. I mean, we haven't exhausted the state of the art, but we've got a big coordination uh, uh, problem. Uh, so my basic claim is, is that 3.0 is greater than 1.0. Uh, why? Because it's a sequence coordinated and integrated. Uh, okay, and here you've got the autonomous professors, and the professors like this. Uh, and, I, and, and I guess I'm a 3.0 guy because as much as I like my autonomy, I would like to be part of that circle because at an institutional level, you're cranking out really better lawyers. And the better lawyers are affecting society and uh, making the world a, uh, a better place. And so I'm willing to trade in some of my autonomy, even maybe a lot of it, in, in order to be there, because I, I think I've at least talked myself into the idea that this is better than this, and I want to be affiliated with or, or part of the prime movers to move this. Now, this is institutional level. So, so a, a law school that's a 3.0 will beat the pants out of a school that's 1.0. Now, I want to just say one thing about 1.0, uh, because one professor can make a difference. And, uh, and I'm reminded of this from time to time, and so I'm up in the... Uh, on the 11th floor, the 10th floor, uh, talking to some people. And I had picked up on this uh, prior, you know, you know, Ron Stout's been teaching here for uh, you know, a while, teaching this law and technology. Nobody thought it was particularly relevant, probably, a lot of people for, for many, many uh, years. And, uh, but he's teaching these people these skills. John's helping them out. They're doing some interesting uh, things. And now you find out that, that the places like SafeArth, which is the, are doing some amazing things, are kind of filled with Ron's students. And so, and so if we write a, do a little genealogy going back in time, you can find out that one professor can make a big difference. But if we can kind of scale run and then, you know, do it at an institutional level, uh, then the institution gets the benefit and then you start disrupting hierarchies, legal education hierarchies. Now, I know, that the, the, I know what the uh, criticism is going to be. The criticism is going to be, well, 1.0 is filled with, the, this is Harvard, and they don't need to change, and everyone will, will, will do that because it's Harvard. And the 3.0, even though uh, it's better, you know, starts with just marginally less attractive inputs. And I want to tell you empirically, I'm not going to traffic models, I'm going to talk in, uh, uh, facts for a minute because I think that that's, that claim is exactly wrong. So, uh, so I want to show you uh, what the, uh, what, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a distribution of cognitive uh, uh, ability. And so the good news is if you get into law school, you won the one for six lottery because pretty much our filtering system with standardized tests are such to basically say that unless you're kind of one standard deviation from the mean on cognitive ability, it's really hard to get into professional school these days. And cognitive ability, so, so, you're, so pretty much all of our students are to the, are to the right of this. And some, for some strange reason, we keep on sorting after we've sorted to the one for six. And we think, well, there must be you know, further differentiation to be made. Well, the cognitive or the IO psychologists have been working on this problem for 
oh, a century now, and this is what the distribution uh, looks like when we take cognitive ability and performance over time. Uh, one of the reasons that cognitive ability tests are so useful is because kind of right up here, that's the kind of the cutoff for professional schools, for doctors, engineers, lawyers, things like uh, that. You know, kind of here is kind of people where they're, they're pretty good at selling and stuff like that. You know, kind of clerical work is kind of uh, here. And this is a steep line right here. So, so and I was somebody who did blue collar work uh, in, my, in my 20s. And I was really bad at it. Uh, you know, uh, and so, so I was kind of mismatched. I kind of experienced this. I kind of was doing work where I was, where I was a firefighter paramedic. And there's just people who were just better than me. Uh, because that they were passionate and they were, they, they were just much better fits than me. I did very well in the standardized test to get hired. I mean, uh, so, uh, uh, but, uh, but we get to hear the line flattens out. And so cognitive ability doesn't really explain very much performance after you get over a particular uh, 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 threshold. So I want to traffic, and so what that's suggesting is that things like uh, a drive and things like uh, playing time really matter. So in other words, education could be part of that explanatory uh, variance for why people are high performers. And high performance is really what we're all about. So I'm going to traffic in my last model for the day. And this one comes from a Nobel laureate. So I'm bringing out the big guns now. Has anybody read uh, uh, Dan Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow? Of course, there's a literate crowd. This is great. Lots of uh, people. Well, he says at the beginning of his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he said, I'm trafficking the models. These things aren't right. There's no system one or system two. But this metaphor is useful for explaining how your brain works. And he says, system one is fast thinking. And uh, it's, uh, I think Ray Bailey explained it to me uh, this way. It's what allows him to kind of be on the cell phone while he's driving on a freeway in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, but God forbid you put a 16-year-old in the car. She needs her full brain to make sure she doesn't crash. So she can't use system one to basically allocate her brain time. But, but it, it's automatic thinking, very fast, mostly right, but low stakes kind of uh, stuff. We like it because it's a low glucose uh, activity. It doesn't take a lot of energy to do system one stuff. We, we'll, as, we'll do as much as we possibly can in system one because system two is effortful. The first year of law school is all system two stuff. It's slow thinking. It's painful. It's effortful. Uh, and, uh, but Kahneman talks later in his book about this thing called expert intuition. This is what lawyers get lawyers. This is why lawyers allow them to make a lot of money and gets them into huge trouble. A lot of the stuff that we're talking about regarding change management, this is why lawyers are so difficult. Uh, expert intuition looks just like system one. It's the great trial lawyer. Uh, it's, the, it's the great M&A lawyer. They can spot things from a mile away, and then they can give you your reasoning afterwards, but their first gut is right. It's pattern recognition at a very uh, high level and allows these people to charge $900 or $1,000 an hour. Uh, expert intuition. I can't, as an educator, create people with expert intuition because it takes longer to, to uh, do that. But, but expert intuition looks like system one, but it gives you the benefits of, uh, of system uh, uh, two. And Get Gladwell talks about that in one of his books. I think it was called Blink. So uh, Kahneman says, well, and the, the difficulty about expert intuition is when you wander out of your domain of expertise, you're really just a novice in system one. You know? So you're making all sorts of mistakes. So when lawyers start wandering out of their domain of expertise and say, well, because I'm a genius over here, I'm a genius in all things, and they start making foolish mistakes, and they don't listen to business people. And they don't listen to basic business principles because they think they know better. We, this whole dialogue regarding non-lawyers, well, non-lawyers can't know anything because I'm a lawyer and I make $900 an hour. And this is one of the big change management issues that we deal with. Well, how do we create more expert intuition? Well, Kahneman actually addresses this. He says, whether professionals have a chance to develop intuitive expertise depends essentially on the quality and speed of feedback as well as sufficient opportunity for practice. It's education. You create experts through education. You create them through environments of feedback and opportunities for practice. Now, the lawyers and law firms, in my experience, focus entirely on cost. And they don't compare it to value. Yes, it, it costs a lot to create these kind of people, but their value is 900 bucks an hour. You'll get your money back. Uh, and so uh, and, and I laugh about this because I go and I talk to these fancy law firms, and they say where they're hiring from. You go, into, go into their white collar practice, and you find a bunch of people who started off the Cook County Prosecutor's Office. Well, they got early at bats. And I remember this theory came to me vividly. I talked to a guy who's got one of the biggest private equity practices on the West Coast. And, he, and I said, you know, David, what's the, what's the secret for your success? And he goes, uh, he said, I thought, well, because he's brilliant, he went to a fancy law school. He said, I got early at bats. And he walks me through this career history 
of basically getting pushed into a situation where he had a little bit of knowledge and he had to use that knowledge to get a lot more experience. And then, uh, a, and then somebody left the firm and he got a lot more work. And he realized, well, I can create an entire practice out of this. And he, and he called his entire uh, ex, uh, success early at bats. I thought that was pretty humble, humbling. So anyway, uh, uh, so uh, I want to kind of wrap up here. We can get, get into the exercise by going to uh, this. It, uh, 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 tell me which way we're going to change things. Is it going to be think, analyze, change, or see, feel, uh, change? Which is the better strategy? The change management folks have looked at this, but I want your opinion. Which is the better? First of all, which is the way that the lawyers would typically do it, and what's the right way to do it? Maybe that's the right way to do it. Which way do the lawyers, uh, the, uh, lawyers are going to pick one. Uh, what do the change management people do? Two. And so you've got to build prototypes. You've got to build prototypes so they can see it and feel it instead of all the abstract objections that, uh, that we're very good at doing it. So, so I hope that the exercise is about building prototypes because prototypes will get us to a, 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 a three, a model three in my uh, opinion. So I thought about this. And I talked to Susan yesterday. Thank you very much, Susan and Karen, for helping me uh, be here uh, uh, today. And I thought, well, I better give the lawyers, is, or there's some lawyers in the room and some non-lawyers in the room, but give some examples, for, at least for the lawyers. So, uh, so, uh, so let's just think about three quick axes to kind of do our 12% exercise. And I'll explain what 12% means in just a second. Uh, we have doctrine. And we have, uh, so we kind of, you know, you know, what we teach in doctrine versus practical skills. And so the practical skills are the kind of, uh, the, 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 the kind of on the, uh, the, the dimension that's on the outs. Then you've got the lecture and Socratic method, but then you have experiential, which is learning by doing. Or I guess what I've learned today from Richard is sex training, kind of think the, the, along those lines uh, here. Uh, and then, and then uh, we have a law and law and economics, law and literature, but also kind of law and technology, law and process management, law and pro uh, uh, process improvement, stats, and things like uh, that. And kind of think about the three different dimensions, and maybe some of the work can be thinking about what's in the orange uh, uh, here. Uh, because to a certain nation uh, uh, is in the white, and what might be different would be in the, uh, in the orange. And I'll give you one more example. And you know, we had a lot of great examples up here at the panel. Uh, but one more thing to kind of think about in terms of filling out our exercise is, uh, is uh, this. I mean, we got torts, contracts, property, civil procedure. And I said inside the clockworks. This is basically comes from the original crevasse system was a lawyer education uh, model. And it was routinized. And it was to skill people up. They take good inputs and they turn them into great, sophisticated uh, business uh, lawyers. And so I want to remind people that we've, we've done this before. Uh, what I would add to the clockworks would be collaborative skills, industry knowledge, effective communication. We can build stuff to do to kind of fill that out. Now, this is Henderson's uh, uh, vision, so you don't have to stick with it at all. Another thing that I would consider doing is project management, basics of network analysis and stats, basics of systems engineering, basics of knowledge uh, management, and basics of design as a discipline. Design, just think iPhone, which is entirely built from the user backwards. One button, one button is not too confusing for me to deal with. My daughter can master it long before I did. And so that's all the design discipline. And Ron's exactly right that that's going to be a huge thing. And then decision making is basically uh, the science of decision making, which is the kind of in thinking fast and slow, and basically becoming aware of how we fool ourselves through silly heur heuristics. And that ought to be, because lawyers make their living in judgment, we ought to at least to know where we're fooling ourselves. And so I think the science of decision making ought to make a comeback into the, uh, into the, into the, uh, uh, into the uh, curriculum. So I'm going to finish up with this. We can't get to 3.0 right away. So a, a good change management thing would be, uh, would be just a few people relinquishing their autonomy, what I call the kind of 12%. Uh, to build prototypes, and we're having so much fun, we get some early accolades and returns uh, that we eventually grow from 12%. So let's just be modest here. Let's just think about a few people collaborating. Instead of, you know, what, this is what we can do today without permission. We can collaborate, we can relinquish some of our autonomy. I've done this at Indiana, and this is basically uh, one person a year, one Ron Stout a year, and every year the law school, or, or three people getting together and doing some kind of a capstone for an entire semester. And so, uh, and so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discharge you folks uh, uh, now, and we can go do our, our exercise. Thank you very much.
from 10.15 to 11.15, reconvening here sharply at 11.15 to do the larger group. Uh, just another quick note is today, just because of some availability of space, two of the breakout rooms are on the fifth floor, so we won't be on the third floor today. Uh, so I think it's five, maybe one on two, one here, and, and the rest in the, in the lower level. So just take a look again at your list that you were given yesterday. I think there's an extra on the registration table if you need one. And we'll see you in the breakout groups in about 12 minutes. Thanks. Your brick. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> the, I love this brick, though. This is a really important one. I was, I was completely serious with it. It was a, kind of an epiphany for me when I saw this brick uh, put together and realized, like, you know, whatever happens now, uh, you guys were thinking about it for decades. Seriously. Damn it. Does it feel a little bit better now? Um, a little. A little. Uh, 